a question. What is the difference between classical economics and Keynesian economics? Isn't that the difference between government intervention in the economy? So classical believes in laissez-faire and no intervention, and the Keynesian does. Yeah, in. classical economics believes that the government does not need to intervene in the economy because we have mechanisms by which the economy will self-correct itself, right? The economy will always have or will always gravitate towards equilibrium because prices are flexible, because interest rates are flexible, and because wages are flexible. And we used to believe that in the late 1700s for almost 200 years. Then in the 1930s, we begin to experience a situation in which we went into something similar to what we're experiencing today. What we're experiencing today is a recession that came as a result of us closing the economies. We closed the economy. We tell companies, don't produce. We told companies, tell your people to go back to the houses and be safe. So we put a halt in the economy. And as a result of this, create a lot of unemployment, a lot of economic need, and that's what we're experiencing. Well, in the 1930s, we had a very similar situation, but it was not because of government intervention. It was simply because of non-government intervention. In other words, the economy, we used to believe the economy is going to correct itself, so we allowed the economy to move towards wherever it was moving. It began by having a, a collapse of the market system, and not the market system, but the, the, uh, the Wall Street, a collapse of the market system, of, the, of the Wall Street, uh, the stocks begin to go down in prices and people begin to lose their money and people begin to drop their shares and the market collapse, right? When the market collapsed, then a lot of people were financially, you know, in situations in which they were not able to, to, to do what the, the things they used to do because they have lost all their wealth. And now at that point, a lot of people were investing in the market because it was very easy for you to go to the bank and ask for a loan to invest in the market. Now think about this. So many people were actually you know, borrowing money to, to actually invest in the market, in the stock market, and individuals usually only had about 10 cents out of every dollar they were investing. So an individual would go to the bank and say, hey, I have $1,000, do you lend me $10,000 so I can invest in the market? Or $9,000. So the bank will lend this guy $9,000, this guy had $1,000, boom, he invested $10,000 in the market. So which means that for most individuals at that point in the 1920s, all the ownership, all the equity they had in the market was only 10%. So then when the market began to drop by 10%, boom, individuals lost all their wealth, everything they have. And then the market began to go lower than 10%, so they begin to lose not only what they have, but they also begin now to be liable for the money they have borrowed. So when the market dropped by 40%, individuals drop everything they had, and now they have lost everything they had, plus now they all owe 30% of what they lost in addition to the banks. So people were killing themselves, literally killing themselves. They have lost their farm, they have lost their houses, you know. So it was a time of fear in the nation, right? And as a result of this, then people begin to stop buying. And you know the story. They stop buying, stop production, stop production, let go of people. And it went down and down and down. And we said the economy is going to sell correct. We don't have to do nothing about it. And we waited and we waited and we waited and we waited. By 1933, we had 20 plus, 25% unemployment. At that point, that's when we say, Something had to be done. And then this British guy by the name of John Maynard Keynes came out with a solution or an idea that was actually adapted by most governments. And the idea is, okay, what we need to do is government intervention. Okay? So today we're going to try to understand how government intervention works, how do they do it, how do they measure the amount of intervention they need to do, and are they successful or not. Okay? So let's begin. Okay, so let's begin by trying to understand if the economy is actually, if the economy will actually self-correct itself, okay? We're gonna try to understand if the economy actually has what we need to have stability, okay? We're going to try to explain how the economy works, the circle of flow of income and product. We're going to learn about injections and leaks. These are new terminology that we're going to learn. And then the most important thing that we're going to learn in this chapter is what is the multiplier, how the multiplier works? Okay, and what can the government do to take us out of a recession or to pull us back from an inflationary gap? In other words, the economy is mo moving too fast, okay? 
So John Maynard Keynes actually can challenge the classical assertion that the economy will always correct itself, right? He actually said those automatic self-adjustment mechanisms do not actually exist, right? And if we don't do nothing, this unemployment is going to continue. And again, it's a review, you already know this. And again, this debate or this idea of government intervention began to appear in the 1930s when we were beginning to go into a recession. Well, on this chapter, we're going to try to understand specifically how the market corrects itself, why does it fail, what do we need to do to correct the market, okay? So instead of showing you these graphs, I'm going to just create my own graphs here. That will, I think will be easy to understand. Okay, this is what we have. Okay, as you already know, the firms and the households, they're the two main players in the economy. The firms create the aggregate supply, everything they produce, and the households is the one that create the total aggregate, well, not the households, but they're the main players in creating the aggregate demand because the aggregate demand is made by the other players. Remember, aggregate demand is equals to C plus I plus G, plus X minus M. So the total demand creates, you know, uh, enough demand that buys everything that is actually produced. Historically, we used to believe this. He said, look, if consumers are only buying a thousand dollars and companies are producing a thousand dollars worth of products, the economy is in disequilibrium because we are actually consuming less than what we are producing. But if we only consuming 800, that means that we are actually saving 200. And now companies are stuck here for inventories of 200. This disequilibrium that we have at this point is not going to be permanent because eventually the companies are going to say, I need to get rid of these inventories. And when companies begin to actually lower the prices to get rid of inventories, individuals are going to realize that's a good buy and they will draw their money from savings and they go and buy this. So in other words, the economy will always self-correct itself, right? Again, in the 1930s, we begin to realize that that was not the story because in the companies begin to lower the prices, but individuals were afraid and they would not buy it. And they continue lowering the prices and they continue lowering the prices and still people were not responding. So then at that point, companies begin to cut production. They begin to let go of workers and now we have more workers unemployed and then the fear multiplied. The fear multiplied. And because now people were losing the jobs, the people that were working now were really afraid that next month it was going to be them. So then aggregate demand actually decreased, you know, by about 20%. Immediately, people were just simply not buying. Then companies decreased output by about 20%, unemployment increased by about 20%, and the cycle was beginning to emerge. The cycle began to emerge. Well, again, Keynesian economics, or classical economics, I'm sorry, used to believe that it will correct itself for some reasons. Because this is what classical economics used to believe. You say, look, the firms buy factors of productions from the households. The households have the money, and now what the households are going to do with their money, okay? Either they're going to consume or they're going to save. That's it. So every time individuals save, the money goes out of the circle. In other words, the money is no longer going back and forth. It gets out of the circle. So then savings is a leak out of the economy. In other words, savings to a certain extent is not really that good for the economy. That's what we used to believe. You know, classical economics, savings is actually a leak. Money goes out of the economy, right? Another thing that we used to believe is that when individuals spend money, they consume not only American goods, but they also consume imports. We buy from other countries. So then when we buy from other countries, we also have money that is flowing out of the U.S. economy. That's another leak out of the economy, right? So then when we say we are putting money out of the circle, when we buy imports, we are putting money out of the circle, and then when we pay taxes, for which we have no choice, then we have money that goes out of the circle. So then the leaks out of the economy is saving taxes and imports. See, the money does not stay in the economy going back and forth. And then we believe that we don't have to worry about it because all these leaks are going to eventually become injections. In other words, the money is going to be injected back into the economy. For example, savings, when people begin to save, <clears throat> interest rates begin to decrease. 
And when interest rates begin to decrease, then that becomes very favorable for companies to borrow money. So then companies borrow these savings, right? The saving goes to, to the firms, and then the firms use this money and do investments. So the money comes back into the economy in the form of an inject, no, injection. It's injected back into the economy. When the government receives taxes, then the government has revenue, and they're going to use this to do government purchases. So then the government, the purchases is another injection into the economy, right? And when we buy imports, I mean that now Japanese and Chinese and Argentinians and all people from all over the country now, they have money because we purchased something from them and they're going to use that money and they're going to buy from us. So every time we export to them, then it's money coming into the economy. So money is injected into the economy. So we used to believe that the economy will correct itself because leaks will always be equal to injections. Right? Will be something like this. This is my own, this is, we'll call this the hustle model to illustrate my concept. This is, this, I call this the hustle bathtub theory. You know, I used to draw a person taking a bath, but I don't do that anymore. Okay, so think about this. If we open the water and the water is coming into the bathtub, the water is injected. What is the injections in the economy? Investments, government purchases, and exports. In other words, every time we invest by companies, that money coming to the economy, it increases the activity, economic activity. Let's call this the GDP, the level of economic activity. When the government buys from us, it increases GDP. When we sell to other people, it increases the GDP. But then on this flow, we also have money that leaks out of the economy. Every time people save money, it gets out of the economy, out of the circle. Every time we pay taxes, the money goes out of the economy. And every time we import, money goes out of the economy. <clears throat> so let me see if you can understand a little bit of physics or a little bit of uh, science. Let's assume these walls on the bathtub, you know, they are incredibly tall. There's no limit on how high they can go. If the inflow is higher than the outflow, what's going to happen to the water? To the water level. Come on, you know. Gonna Open rise. the water in the bathtub and the water level is going to what? Continue yeah, to increase, right? right? It's going to rise. Well, how about if there's no limit on how this high the walls can go? How high the water is going to go? When is it going to stop? When is it going to overflow? Okay, I mean, it's not going to overflow because there's no limit on the walls, right? But what's going to happen this is that as the water begins to accumulate higher and higher and higher and higher, it's going to create a pressure that eventually that pressure is going to explode and it's going to force the water to come out at the same rate that the water is coming in. And that's more or less the theory, you know, that if the economy begins to be stimulated, 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 eventually People have everything they need and they begin to save and they have to pay more taxes and they begin to buy from other countries so the economy will stimulate itself. But now what will happen if it's the other way around? Again, here we have the situation and now in this situation, the water that is coming in is just trickling down, but boom, but the outflow is actually bigger. Well, the water level is going to what? It's going to decline. The question is, is this water level, is this bathtub, is ever going to be dry, totally dry? Well, as long as there's some water coming in, that is never going to be dry. Does that make sense? It's never going to be dry because there's some droplets of water. So which simply means that there's no way an economy can die itself. It will never die. Even in places like Somalia, which there's not a lot of economic activity, there's some economic activity, right? So what I'm just simply trying to tell you is that we used to believe that the economy will correct itself because of the the inflows and the outflows in the economy, the leaks and the injections in the economy, okay? <clears throat> so let me come back to this. So this is what we're learning then, that the economy has leaks. And what are the leaks? The leaks is the money goes, that goes out of the circle. Every time we save, every time we import, and everybody, every time we pay taxes. You know, I don't like the way they put it here, household taxes and business taxes, and you know, and saving by business, they're all the same. Taxes, savings, and imports. 
Okay, it's a leak out of the economy, right? But then we say that this is actually comes back into the economy and they become injections. And the injections are exports. Every time we sell to another country, we have money coming in. Every time the government spends, it's money coming into the economy. And every time a company do an investment, it's injection that come into the economy, okay? So injections, investment, government spending, and exports. So the economy will be in macro equilibrium if injections and leaks are the same. I mean, the ideal will be that this will take place when the economy is at full employment. I mean, that's the ideal. That will be, that will be heaven. Everything's one, one, working wonderful. The amount of money coming out of the economy is equal to the amount of money coming into the economy. The reality is that that's never happened. Well, historically, we used to believe that, yes, they will be equal. So classical economics used to believe that leaks will always equal injections. And the reason is because of the flexibility of interest rates, right? And the flexibility of wages, we discussed that, right? So again, by the 1930s, this began to create a problem because we realized that in reality, you know, the amount of savings was not equal to investments. And as a result of this, then consumption was actually decreasing and GDP was actually following or actually going down. So this creates a very gloomy outlook of the economy. Right? And again, in classical economics, we used to believe this, guys. We used to believe that if people are saving, interest rates are going to drop. And if interest rates are going to drop, then companies are going to borrow this money and do investments. So savings and investments will always be the same. Well, we realized in the 1930s that in reality, uh, companies don't do investments based on interest rates. Do you remember the lecture yesterday? But what is the function of, I'm sorry, consumption is a function of disposable income. And then we say investments is a function of what? Anybody recall? Investments is a function of, we say interest rates is one, but the other one was? Is that the animal spirits? Yeah, animal spirits. Good job, Cassie. Yeah, yeah, it's animal spirits. We used to believe in animals, in other words, Companies do not do investments based on how cheap interest rate is. Companies do investment in the mentality, are we going to be able to make money? How does the future look? Does it look bright? Does it look bad? Think about what is happening now to interest rates. How low are interest rates now? Anybody know? Interest rates are almost zero. A company can go and borrow money almost at a zero cost. You can go and buy a car today at a zero interest rate. Not for 24 months or 36, but you can buy a brand new car at zero interest rates for 72 months, and you don't even have to make a payment for the first six months. I mean, how low can you go? In some cases, you go out and can buy a brand new car. You don't have to pay a single cent, and you can come out with a check out of $100 to help you go on a vacation. So as you can see, if you go to the bank and they give you a $500 bonus for getting a loan from them, what you actually get in is a, what, a negative interest rates. I mean, you cannot go lower the negative interest rates. And the same thing goes with companies. Now, how is it possible that a company can borrow a negative interest rate? Look, a company could go to a bank and ask for a business loan, right? And the government, has already has a program in which you borrow to continue your business or to continue working, uh, having employees, and you spend X amount of money that you borrow, you know, in keeping the jobs of your individuals, your loan is actually forgiven. So as you can see, this is a negative interest rate. But even then, even then, individuals, individuals are not actually what? They are not actually investing, right? Because they, are, they, are, they see the economy I say gloomy, it doesn't, it doesn't look you know, very, very positive, okay? So as you can see, we're trying to try to understand if the economy is actually, will correct itself, okay? So again, classical economists used to believe that, look, if we have increasing inventories, companies will lower the prices and people are going to buy them, right? And inventories are going to disappear. 
So then we don't need to do nothing because aggregate demand will always be equal to aggregate supply or supply will always be equal to aggregate demand. Okay, well, again, that did not happen. We lower prices and people still did not buy things in the 1930s. So then at that point, then this guy with the general manager Keynes, he simply say, look, the economy is unstable. The idea that everything's going to become beautiful by just letting the market forces to operate it's a fallacy, it doesn't happen. What we need to do, we need to actually intervene in the economy. Because what is happening at this point is this. And again, we're talking about the 1930s. You know, companies are reducing production because nobody's buying their products, which simply means now we have more layoffs, more people out of work. There's a reduction in income, and if there's a reduction in income, there's still going to be another trickle effect in which there's going to be a further decrease in consumption. And if there's more decrease in consumption, then companies are going to be forced to let go of more people and more people out. There's also another round of decreasing income and the cycle will begin and it will multiply because in the economy, we have a multiplier effect. We have a multiplier effect. And let me see if I can explain what we're talking about when we're talking about a multiplier effect, right? In my own words, that will be easier than the textbook for you to understand how it works. Okay. We say that for every dollar individual receives, there's two things he can do. He can consume or he can save according to his marginal propensity to consume or his marginal propensity to save, right? So if I spend 80 cents out of everything that I do, then that means that I have an MPC of 0.8 and my MPS is 0.20, which simply means out of every dollar I receive, I consume 80 cents and I save 20 cents, okay? So look how the, this idea of uh, a multiplier effect works in the economy, okay? Look, I go and spend $100. I go to the store and spend $100. This $100 that I spend, that's what my initial spending become the income of someone. Some, somebody received $100 in income, the owner of the store. Now, for simplicity, let's assume that in this economy, we have an MPC of 0 0.9. What does that mean? What does MPC of 0.9 means? Come on, guys, you know. Marginal propensity to consume. Yes, sir, and what does that mean? It means sort of, Kind of like marginal utility, I would think um, your sort of motivation, marginal motivation to uh, consume an object. So, then, so what are people are going to do every time they receive a dollar? They're going to want to spend it. How much are they going to spend? Uh, according to the coefficient of the marginal propensity. Okay, and I'm saying that it's 90%, 9.9, so they're going to spend what? 90 cents out of every dollar they receive, or 90%. So then look at this. I went into the economy. It was me, and I spent $100. I put in $100 of worth of income for someone, this owner of the store. This owner of the store, he's going to do this, boom. He's going to consume, and he's going to consume 90% of that. And he's going to save $10, savings and consumption, right? Because he has an, if he has an MPC of 0.9, he has an MPS of 0.10. So he's going to save $10. So now this $90 that he consumed become the income of someone else. Right? And what is someone else is going to do? Well, he's going to save $9 and he's going to spend consumption of $81. 90% of that. So 90% of 100 is $90. 90% of 90 is 81. 90% of 81, help me. Somebody put the calculator. So it, it begins like this. I spend $100, become the income of someone. Somebody's going to spend 90% of that. $90. 90% of 90 is $81. 90% of 81, somebody has a calculator? I got $72.90. Okay, 72.90 and 90% of that? $65.61. Okay, and 90% of that? Tell me. $59.05. And 90% of that? <laughs> Come on, we... We're going to go all the way to zero. $53.14. And 90% of that? $47.83. And 
in that episode of that? $43.05. And 90% of that? <laughs> $38.74. Okay. You begin to see what's going on. Right? If I was to add all these consumptions that took place, I already know what the number is going to be. If you don't believe me, you can do it. Go 90%, 90%, 90%, 90%, 90%, 90%, 90% until you go to zero. And this is going to be $1,000. So then an initial consumption of $100 generate a multiplier effect in the economy in which we can consume 1,000. How do I know that? Well, because that's a very simple formula and that's the multiplier. It's called the multiplier, okay? I have a quick question. Yes, sir. So all of these transactions represent money changing hands. Um, exactly, sir. Yeah. Yeah. It's so so I guess it shouldn't be confused that this is necessarily like wealth being generated per se, but just uh, sort of wealth being transferred. Between uh, no, 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 no. It's actually wealth generated. Let, 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 let me let me see if I can if I can if I can come to this. Hold on for a second. Let me let me look at everybody's faces. Okay. Uh, let me stop sharing and let me come back. Okay. Okay. I come into the economy and buy $100 worth of Walmart. That personal activity that I'm doing by itself is generating in the economy a multiplier effect that somebody has those $100 and never think about this. What is money? Money in itself is not wealth. No, it's a piece of paper. It's something of value. The value of money is based on the idea that somebody's going to receive it as a form of payment and you receive it as a form of payment because you know you will be able to use it to buy something that you really want. Okay, so when we injected $100 in the economy, that creates that desire for somebody else, you know, to generate something to have that because he's gonna use that to buy something else. So then we produce something and then we produce something and then we produce something and we produce something and we produce something. It will be like this, look, I go and say to Ashley, Ashley, you know, uh, I'm gonna be going this weekend, me and my wife, can you take care of, ch of our child's and we're gonna pay you a hundred dollars, you know, for this day. So, so Ashley is going to babysit for a hundred dollars, right? So she generate a service for me worth a hundred dollars. Then Ashley goes out and goes to, I don't know, she goes to Jira and says, Jira, I know that you know how to, I don't know, that you know how to sew, can you sew a blast for me? You know, now she's not going to spend everything. She, she's going to save, 10%, see, everybody has an NPC of 0.9. So she go to Gina and Gina said, yeah, I'll do a, an outfit for you for $90. So Gina goes out of her way, right, and creates an outfit for $90. So now Gina has the money and she goes to Melody and says, hey, Melody, you know, I have been looking on Zoom and I really like the lamp that you have in the back. Where do you get that lamp? And, you know, and Melody said, well, actually my dad built it for me. Can you tell your daddy he can build one for me? Right, so Melody goes and talks to her dad, and she said, okay, yeah, I'll do it for 81 bucks. So then Melody's dad goes out and does something for $81. So now he got his money and he's going to spend 90% of that. So he goes to Casey and says, hey, Casey, you know, I like the background on your, you know, on your Zoom, you know, and my daughter's always talking about how beautiful the scenery is. Will it be possible if we can rent your house for $81 for one weekend? So he creates another service. And now Casey has that and he goes to Zach and says, hey Zach, you know, I have been liking your, your hat that you have. Can I buy it from you? Right? So as you can see, look at all the amount of transactions that took place in the economy with only one initial transaction. That's the multiplier effect. And the multiplier effect is an ideology or an explanation of economic activity, but the multiplier effect also works on reverse. It also works on reverse and that's the problem. Because think about this, if companies decide to postpone an investment that we're going to do, a new building, okay? And let me, let, me, let me use it right here because to me this is very interesting. Let's assume that a company decide to postpone an investment. They have already, before the coronavirus, well, let's use what happened. Airline companies were going to buy planes, right? And some, all the airline companies at this point, they postponed the purchases of a plane. Anybody know what's the average price of a 747? A passenger, passenger plane? 
It's about $160 million. About $160 million. So a company that decides not to buy two planes, they have just taken out of the economy $320 million purchase. That purchase of two planes was going to be the income of someone, the employees that work for Boeing Corporation, and the people that sold the raw material, or they were going to be selling the raw material to make the plane. So then $320 million were taken out of the economy. And assuming that people have a MPC 0.9, then that is going to create another run of a decrease of 90% of that in the economy. 320 times 0.9, how much is it? Three twenty times point nine. Two hundred eighty-eight. So there's a two hundred eighty-eight consumption million in consumption that is not going to take place because people did not purchase the planes. And then that two hundred eighty-eight million dollars was going to be the income of someone else, and because of that, that someone else is not going to invest or consume ninety percent of that, which will be. Two hundred and fifty-nine. Two hundred and fifty-nine, and go run after run after run after run, and boom. What is going to be the impact in the economy of a reduction of three hundred and twenty million dollars, decreasing consumption or investment that is not going to happen? The multiplier, the symbol is a little k, is equals to one divided by one minus the MPC. It's a formula: one divided by one minus the MPC. So in this case, it would be k equals to one divided by one minus 0.9, which is equals to one divided by 0.10, which is equals to 10. Um, Dr. Hasso? Yes. So what is K exactly? What is that? K is a, a Latin symbol that say money multiplier or the multiplier. It's the, tam, the times that money will multiply or the economic impact of, of of an initial investment. It's just how money multiplies in the economy. And the symbol is just K. It's a little K. It's, a, it's like, a, like, a, like a little, like, it's not actually like, it looks like a K, but it's not a K. I don't know how to, I don't know how to you know, it, it looks like a little RK like that. It's the symbol. It's a, a symbol that we have. Just like the euro. What is the symbol of a euro? Why? I don't know. Somebody made a symbol. <laughs> <You> <laughs> right. know, what is the symbol yeah. of the dollar? Of, of the, of the dollar? Why? I don't know. So I'm going to make it. What's the difference between the symbol of a dollar and a peso? Well, the peso only has one. Why? I don't know. Mexicans want it to be different, I guess. <laughs> okay. And what is the Japanese yen? You know, so uh, people just create symbols. You know, so in this case, whoever came up with this, which was John Maynard Kane, he said, okay, this little multiplier, little K, well, is how money multiplies in the economy. Okay. So it's very interesting because what we actually understand him is the impact in the economy every time there's an increase or a decrease in consumption, okay? So this is the way it works. This is the multiplier effect. Let's say, where does run begin? Right here. Investments drop by $100 million, billion. Well, guess what? That $100 billion was going to be the income of someone else. So now we have a $100 billion in, in unsold good, goods. You know, somebody did not purchase that 100. And that was going to be the 100 potential wages of individuals, right? So now individuals are going to reduce consumption by $100 billion. And that $100 billion was going to be the income of somebody, a household. And now he's not going to be able to consume what he was planning. On this case, he had an MPC of 0.75, you know, which means that he was going to consume 75%, so consumption is reduced by 75 billion. So now companies do not have that $75 billion they were hoping. Restaurants, right? Because the sales have dropped by $75 billion. So that means that the wages of all the people that work on the restaurant industry has decreased by $75 billion. Their income has reduced by 75, and now they're going to reduce consumption by 75% of that, which will be $56 billion. And that $56 billion was going to become the income of someone else. And it goes round after round after round after round. Right? So if investments decline, inventory accumulates, production is cut back, income decreases, 
consumption decreases, and then we go back to step number two. You know, inventory accumulate, production is cut back, income decreases, right? And income decreases and consumption decreases. So you go a multiplier effect over and over and over again. And again, the multiplier effect works both ways. It works going one way when we consume, and it also works in opposite direction when we decrease consumption, right? So, um, what we're trying to understand is what we do, what, what do we need to do? So then the multiplier effect is the multiple by which an initial change in spending will alter the total expenditures after the spending of all cycles. And again, the formula is one divided by one minus the MPC. Okay. That's the, the formula for the multiplier. Again, I create a little K and that's the actual symbol of the multiplier. I think the textbook show you the little K when you read the chapter, okay? So if the MPC is 0.75, that means that people consuming 75% of every additional dollar they're going to receive. So let me ask you a couple of questions. If the MPC is 0.75, how much is the multiplier? It's one divided by one minus 75 equals to one divided by 0.25 equals to four, right? Let's see. Let me ask you questions. Do you see a black line going there on your screen? Yes. Okay. I don't know where that black line came from. In my, in my iPad. Ignore it. Okay. If the MPC is 0.75, how much is the multiplier? One divided by one minus 0.75 equals to one divided by 0.25 is equals to four. If the MPC is 0.9, how much is the multiplier? That's 10. 10, okay, look, this is a shortcut. If the MPC is 0.9, then the MPS is 0.10, remember? One equals to MPC, plus MPS, so $1 minus your consumption is always going to be equal to your savings. So if you're consuming 90, that means that you're saving 10. So the multiplier will be one divided by 0.10. So then the multiplier is equals to one divided by one minus the MPC or one divided by the MPS. Right? It's the same. Right? So if the MPC is 0.75, how much is the multiplier? It will be one divided by 0.25. If the MPC is 0.9, how much is the multiplier? It's one divided by 0.10. If the MPC is 0.6, what is the multiplier? One divided by four, 2.5. If the MPC is 0.5, how much is the multiplier? Two, okay? What do you think is the actual multiplier, the actual MPC in the United States? Give me a rough estimate. What do you think? On the average, how much people consume out of every dollar they receive? I thought you said point, maybe it's point nine nine. Is that what you said? Where people, uh, where was it point nine? It was the average, the average propensity to consume is about point nine five six, something like that. So the MPC is about 0 0.98, something like that, 0 0.97, okay? So let's just round it up. Very interesting, let's say 0 0.97. On the average, people spend 97 cents out of every dollar they receive of additional income. So if MPC is 0 0.97, that means that the MPS is equal to what, 0.03. They only save three cents out of a dollar. So how, how much is the real multiplier in the economy? One divided by 0.03 is equals to 33. See? So now think about this. So when the government sends you a check for $1,200, when the government sends you a check for $1,200, uh, for some reason the computer kicked me out. Let's see. 
what are you looking on your screen? Um, I still see what you were writing before on like the white. Yeah, okay, let me see if I can leave the meeting and come back. Okay, so I leave the meeting and now let me come back into the meeting. Uh, let me put you on hold for a second. Think about this. The government gives you a check for $1,200. So that $1,200 became the income of individuals. And in reality, we know that individuals are going to spend 97% of that. Or that was the expectations. Okay, so now let's create a, well, let's, let's change the numbers. Let's change the numbers. So the government change, let's say, send you a check for $1,200 and let's assume that you're going to spend $1,000 of that. Okay, or that was the idea that people are going to spend X amount of money. So now, this is the total supply in the economy. And this is the aggregate demand in the economy. So then individuals receive a check for $200 and they decide to spend $1,000. So then what's gonna happen? Consumption is going to go up by $1,000. So you really think about it as a result of this consumption, then the aggregate demand is going to shift here by $1,000, right? So then aggregate demand increased by $1,000. So we went from this place, I don't know what it was, X1, so now here to X2. And then that $1,000 was going to become the income of someone else and someone else is going to spend, let's say 75% of that. So they're gonna spend another what? 750. So consumption goes up by 750 plus 75. And then that was going, to, was going to become the income of someone else and somebody else was going to spend 75% of that. And it will go and it will go and it will go and it will continue until we stop right here. Let me ask you a question. By how much was the increase? And in this case, the MPC is 0.75. By how much was the increase? By how much the GDP increase? Remember, the multiplier is how much it will multiply. How much was the initial consumption? 1,000. 1,000. How much is the multiplier? Four. Four. So it'll be four times 1,000, 4,000. I mean, that income here will be an increase of $4,000. Okay, so now let me jump into, actually, I'm, we're gonna jump now into the next chapter because the next three chapters, they're, they're, all, they're all together, they're all this. So look at this. Let's assume that the economy is presently right here. Uh, hold on. Let's assume that the economy is presently right here. The economy is producing, uh, let's say, uh, 1,000. Prices is 1.6. I'm, I'm just making something like this, okay? So now, the economy goes into a recession, what is happening now, and aggregate demand decrease. And now we end up someplace right here. We end up at 800. This is in billions of dollars, a small country. Right, prices decrease because nobody's buying. Now, what happened to unemployment when AD decreased from AD sub one to AD sub two? What happened to unemployment? If nobody's buying, companies are not producing, they're not producing, they don't have no people working. So unemployment went up. So now let's assume the government looks at this situation and say, hey, we have a problem because you have high levels of unemployment. We need to stimulate the economy. And we need to stimulate the economy all the way back to full employment. This is full employment, 1,000. This is where we need to go, where we used to be. If this nation has an MPC of 0.8, okay, what that means? That everything we do in this economy is going to multiply by, what's the multiplier? Five. Exactly, sir. One divided by MPS, which will be one divided by 0.2, which is equal to five. So everything we do in the economy is going to multiply five times. So if we want to stimulate the economy, how much government purchases have to go up to go back to where we want? How much is the gap that we have? How much is the gap that we have? 200. So what do we need to do? You know, because we want to create a change of 200. You know, we know that something times 
five is going to give me 2,000, 200. So what does the government need to do? Increase 2,000, remember simple economics? You know, on sim simple algebra, 200 divided by five equals to what, 40? So if the government spend $40, of, right? 40 times five equals 200, we will be able to achieve this goal of moving the economy back to equilibrium. So look, this is the way it is, guys. Let me see. Change in GDP, by the way, this is a little triangle. Change in GDP is always equal to initial change times the multiplier. The change in the GDP is always going to be equal to the initial change and the multiplier, which simply goes like this. If the initial change is 200, if the government spent 200, and the multiplier is 10, then the change in GDP is going to be what? 2,000. So let's go right here. We are pressing it right here. We are at 12,000. We are 12,000, that's where we are. The economy is in equilibrium there. This is the aggregate demand. This is the aggregate supply. This is GDP. The economy is in equilibrium at 1,200. Now, let's go right here. The government invests 300. We have an MPC of 0.9. So how much is the multiplier? If the MPC is 0.9, the multiplier is 10, right? So it'll be 300 times 10 equals to 3,000. So then the initial change, when the government increased government purchases by 300, it went up by 300. But that 300 became the income of someone else. And that someone else is going to what? Create another round of consumption. So this is initial, and there's an induced consumption of 90% of 300, right? So that will go by 270, and then 90% of that, and 90% of that, and 90% of that until we end up someplace right here. So how much was the actual change in GDP? Remember, change in GDP equals to initial change times the multiplier. So it'll be change in GDP equals to initial change, which is 300, times the multiplier, which is 10, so the change in GDP is going to be 3,000. So that means that where are we going to end up? 12,000 plus 3,000, we're going to end up at 15,000. So when the government gives you a stimulus check, when the government is giving you stimulus checks, what is what the government is trying to, is trying to achieve? What is the government trying to achieve? Well, what is the government trying to achieve? What the government is trying to achieve is for you to spend that. So that will be the income of someone else or someone else will spend that and it becomes run after run after run after run. Okay. On this case, the MPC is 0.75, so the multiplier is four. So then the size of the multiplier is going to be affected by the size of the MPC, right? So think about this. If the MPC is 0 0.9, how much is the multiplier? 10. If it's 0 0.8, the multiplier is what? 5. If it's 0 0.75, the multiplier is 4. So as the MPC decreases, the multiplier becomes smaller and vice versa. Right? And again, you don't, you don't have to know this. It's just simple, simple logic, okay? How it impacts. So, little exercise. MPC 0 0.9, how much is the multiplier? 10. 10. Right? Point eight, the multiplier is come on guys. Five. Remember, if MPC is point eight, that means savings is two. Right? If it's point six, how much is the multiplier? One divided by four equals two point five. Right? So if the need Let's talk about how it works. For example, if the initial change in the spending is 100 billion, what is going to be the total change in spending when the multiplier is 10? So then the initial change is 100, the multiplier is 10, so then the total change in the economy is going to be 10 times 100 will be what? 1,000 billion. 
If the multiplier is 5, it will be 5 times 100, it will be 500. If the multiplier is 2.5, will be, remember, change in GDP equal to the initial change times the multiplier. So the initial change is 100, the multiplier is 2, so it will be 250. Okay, so Keynesian, John Maynard Keynes said, look, if the economy is in a recession, we don't have to do a big deal in the economy. We don't have to worry about it because we can simply solve any problem that we have. We can get out of recession by government involvement in the economy and whatever the government gets involved in the economy, that's going to create a multiplier effect. So in the 1930s, what was happening was this. This is the aggregate demand and this is the aggregate supply. In the 1930s, people were afraid of the, what was going on in the economy and people were buying less and buying less and buying less. Right? And as a result of this, then the aggregate demand began to decrease. We went from this, let's say from full employment to some place right here. Right? Let's say we went from, I'm just going to make up numbers. We went from 14,000 to 6,000. Right? So we have a decrease in GDP high levels of unemployment, we are an economic recession. So then John Maynard Keynes said, look, if we look at the aggregate demand, which is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M, we know that consumers are afraid. They are not buying. We know that companies are not investing because the economy is collapsing. We know that Chinese and Japanese are not buying from us because they're also suffering. So then the only option that we have is for us to what? To do government spending. And if we spend a hundred billion dollars, that hundred billion dollars is going to be the income of someone else. And that someone else is going to spend according to their multiplier. So it's the initial, the initial change is up 100. And then that becomes the income of someone else. And they spend, let's say 90% of that, and then 90% of that, and 90% of that, and 90% of that, until we reach our goal. Right? So let's see if you're following my story. So we were at 14,000. We are now at 6,000. How much of the government purchases need to be done for us to go back to 14,000 if the MPC is 0.9? I'm asking. Is it 800? Okay. How do you came out to that, Zach? So the multiplier is 10. Okay. Um, so the difference between the 14,000 and the 6,000 is 8,000. Oh, okay. Perfect. So you find the gap. And that's exactly what you need to know. We, the first thing we, we want to know is what is the gap? The gap is 8,000. Right? 8,000. And we know that whatever we do is going to multiply 10 times. So you say 800? Yeah. You remember this? Change in GDP is equals to initial change times the multiplier. So how much is the change in GDP that we want to generate? 8,000. What is the initial change? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. X, right? Times the multiplier, which is what? 10. So we use simple algebra. We divide everything by 10. So it'll be 800 equals to X. And that's what the amount of government purchase that we need to do. If we spend $800, boom, we achieve the objective. Do you see how fascinating this is? I mean, I mean, this is incredible. By the way, guys, let me tell you this. And, and this is just for your knowledge. This is not, in the, this is not on, the, on, the, on the book. Uh, well, let me tell you this. The multiplier effect is not the same nationwide. It's not the same nationwide. Let me explain how this works. If you're in Atlanta, Georgia, and you decide to build a $300,000 home, which in, the, in Atlanta would be an entry-level home. So you're building an entry-level home, $300,000. When you decide to borrow $300 to build a house, you have just create $300,000 in income for the plumber and the electrician and all the people involved in building the house. Right, and you also purchase the raw material. Well, probably it is possible that you purchase, let's say, uh, $50,000 in bricks, right? 
And in Atlanta, I'm pretty sure that in Atlanta, we have a company that makes bricks. So then the $50,000 went boom to somebody in Atlanta. And then that somebody in Atlanta is going to spend it on something that he can buy in Atlanta. See, the money stayed there. But think about, let's change the, the same thing back here to Cleveland. I'm going to build the same $300,000 home. I need $50,000 in bricks. There's no company in Cleveland that makes bricks. So then I'm going to have to buy the brick, let's say, from a company in Knoxville. So then the $50,000 out of the 300000 boom, just it leaked out of this economy. It went to Knoxville. So it's not going to have no impact over here. Right? And now let's assume that we needed to hire some people to build a house, and we were not able to find no one. So we had a construction company from Chattanooga that came over here. So then the salary of those people, the money that I paid, let's say $80,000 in salary, boom, it went to Chattanooga. So how much of that money stay in Cleveland? So then say it's a smaller portion. So then the multiplier or the impact of the multiplier in Cleveland is going to be smaller, right? Even if we spend the same amount of money in certain cities. So then the different cities have different multipliers. It's called rings. And the government reports that. You can actually go and do, you know, uh, rings, multipliers, and it give you by county, you know, by cities. Uh, I think the last time that I saw the multiplier, I did a study of the impact that Lee University students have in the Cleveland community. You know, 5,000 students, 2,000 of them come from outside the La community, and these 2,000, they go to the movies, they buy gasoline, and they go to McDonald's and Taco Bell. So what is the impact that these students have when they spend this, right? And if, I'm trying to remember the numbers because we did this with uh, one of my class projects in my macroeconomic class. And uh, we interview students like on a typical week, what do you do? No, I go to the movies, I go buy this, blah, blah, blah. So we interview 400 students at the, which was close to four, 10%. It was a class of 50 students, so everybody did an interview. We interviewed 400 students, and we came up with the number, what is the average expenditures in movies, in gasoline, in Taco Bell, in McDonald's, you know, Walmart, lists like that. And the impact that students had at that point was $120 million in consumption, right, as a result of the multiplier effect. So as you can see, then Lee University is, was, and will be a very vital industry for Cleveland. We have about 16,000 jobs that indirectly survive in Cleveland because of Lee students. Not only the 1,000 employees for Lee, but we have all the other thousands of people that indirectly are here in business because of Lee. It's very interesting. So that's what we're talking about economic impact and multiplier and how it actually works, okay? Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Let's be back at 11.35, okay? As you already know, the government has some macroeconomic goals. Remember the macroeconomic goals, full employment, price stability, and economic growth. So the government intervenes in the economy in two different ways. One of the ways the government intervenes is by monetary policy, which is simply changing the amount of money in the economy. And if we change the amount of money in the economy, people are going to behave and they're going to consume. So in other words, monetary policy is putting money in the hands of individuals so they can increase their consumption, right? Or take away money from individuals or make it more difficult for them to acquire money. So the aggregate demand will shift to the left as a result of a decrease in consumption. And we will be able to use that to combat inflation. Another way we can do it is by fiscal policy. And fiscal policy changes in government purchases and changes in the level of taxes. So if the government creates a project, that becomes the income in that community, and then that income begins to multiply in the economy, creating a bigger multiplier effect. If we lower taxes, then by lowering taxes, what we are doing is increasing the disposable income of individuals. And remember that consumption is a function of disposable income. So when individuals have more income, they're going to consume more. And if they consume more, then the economy will go back from a recession, or we can do it the other way around. Right? If the economy is moving too fast and we have an inflationary period, then we can contract that inflation by decreasing the level of transfer payments or simply by increasing taxes. Okay? Any questions or any comments? Okay. I don't know about you guys, but I, I really enjoy this, 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 this material uh, because it actually shows the, the, I guess the, I don't know how to put it. In other words, there's something spiritual about this. You really think about it. There's something spiritual about this 
you know, about the creation of God and how everything works and how we as humans interact in the market and we create something good for someone else. And when we create something good for someone else, in return, that individual is going to give us something of value that we're going to be able to you know, trade for someone else for something of value. You know, I mean, uh, and again, it's, it's fascinating. We don't know how things work. I mean, there are certain things that for which we have no explanations. And it's just, it's just the way God works. We society values certain things. Uh, I had a, a young crew uh, mowing my yard yesterday. You know, I was working in, I see this, a, a young crew mowing my yard. And I saw, the, I saw two young Hispanic individuals. And by young, I mean younger than me, you know. Uh, they are probably in their thirties, you know, two young guys in their thirties mowing my yard. So I went and chit chat with them. And where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and after that, you know, after they left, I talked to my wife and I say, what's the difference between these two young guys and me? What's the difference? Why is these two guys working in the sun out there all day long for $80 a day? Right? And then I am here in my house doing a work that is compensated 10 times more, tenfold more. So then the things that I have, you know, these guys are never going to be able to obtain. You know, being able to have a car like my car, so to have a house like my house and things like that, this is not a dream. It's a dream to them. So then what is us or reality? is a dream of someone else. Think about it. So then the question is, why is that the case? And there's no explanation for that. There's no explanation for that. So then coming back to the spiritual realm is what is my obligation as an individual if one day I'm going to become successful? That's the question that I'm asking you. What's going to be my obligation? That I became successful because I'm smart? Or that I became successful because just God opened doors for me? Does that make sense? And if you become successful, then what is going to be your obligation towards your fellow individuals? Just something to think about it. Something to think about it. What's the difference between you that were born in this great nation in which you have the possibilities of becoming successful and a young girl or a young boy that was born in Colombia or Venezuela, right? Or in North Korea. What's the difference? Why were you born here? Why am I here? Interesting, interesting. But everything we do has an impact on someone else. Right? And economically speaking, my actions, economics is the study of the actions that people take to make the best use of scarce resources. So my actions are going to have an impact on someone else. So when I buy or when I don't buy, when I consume or when I don't consume, when I give or when I don't give, all those has a repercussion effect in the economy. Okay, so let's continue with the chapter. I think we're coming to an end. And we're trying to understand the, the process. So then when individuals don't consume, Right? When individuals don't consume, that creates a decrease in income. And that decrease in income is going to cause a consumer spending to decline. Which in turn, this consumer spending decline is going to lead to a further production cutbacks because companies are not producing because you are not buying. And then more jobs are going to be lost, more loss in income, and then it's going to be even a decrease in consumption. And the aggregate demand will shift to the left by a multiplier of the first initial change times the multiplier. So what we end up, we can end up with a recessionary gap. So a recessionary gap is equal to the difference between where we are and where we want to go. Now, in this case, for example, full employment takes place at QF, the aggregate demand decrease, and now we're at C, so we have a recessionary gap. So what can we do to close the gap? Right, the government can increase government purchases, the government can lower taxes, the government can increase transfer payments to be able to move us towards the aggregate demand. Okay, so if we have a recessionary gap, that means that we are producing less than what we are capable. We're inside the frontier. We have unused production. 
the economy is underproducing, high levels of unemployment. On the other hand, you know, if, well, think about this. If we were originally at full employment at 3,000, then the aggregate demand begin to decrease, 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 and we end up at 2,800. If we have an NPC, let's assume in this economy, we have an NPC of 0 0.9. What does the government has to do to close that gap? See, the NPC is 0 0.9, the multiplier is 10. So everything we do is going to multiply 10 times. What is the gap that we have? Yeah. Uh, 200, right? So it'll be 200 divided by 10, which will be what? 20. So if the government spent 20 million, then that 20 million becomes the income of somebody else, and then it creates an induced consumption of 20% of 90% of that, and then 90% of that, and 90 percent of that, and we are able to achieve full employment. Okay. So now how about if we have an inflationary gap? The economy is supposed to be here at 3,000, and boom, we end up over here. Then we have to do totally the opposite to move the economy towards where we want to. So do we increase purchases or decrease purchases? We decrease government purchases, right? Do we increase transfer payments or decrease transfer payments? We decrease transfer payments, right? We, de we, we make it more difficult for companies to borrow money, right? And we can close that recessionary gap. Now you have to understand that the economy, inflation takes place for two reasons. We have what is called a demand pull inflation. Demand pull inflation is when everybody's buying. So if everybody's buying, 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 we're going to create an inflationary gap, right? So if we have a demand pull inflation, then we can contract inflation. It's a, our obligation. It's the government obligation to control inflation. It's part of the macro outcome goals. And the way we can decrease inflation is by forcing the aggregate demand to shift to the left, right? That's what we need to do. So uh, again, you already know that the economy goes through booms, ups and downs, cycles of the economy. Uh, historically, we used to believe that this was normal, that we don't have to worry about it. The problem is that these cycles now are becoming very prolonged, very prolonged, long times, long periods of time. So by government intervention, we can probably shorter that gap. So for example, if inflation is going up, up and up and up, we can try to attack it to go back. If we have a recession is going down, down, and down, we can do something to what? Attack that to go back into a recovery. And by the way, not everybody agrees. Not everybody agrees that government intervention is the way to go. Because what many economists are saying is, look, what we are doing is trying to, to change the behavior of individuals. And in some cases, when we collect the information or the data, we do not know exactly what is going on in the economy. And let me give you, uh, an example, real life example of what's going on now. They are debating the idea of a second stimulus check. Let's go ahead and give people more money so that we can stimulate the economy. But not everybody agree that that's what we're supposed to do. At this point, the Republicans say, no, we cannot do that. And the reason is because we do not know yet what is the impact of what we did the first time. We put a trillion dollars, think about this guy, we put a trillion dollars worth of money in the economy. The total package was three trillion dollars. Three trillion dollars that we put in the economy. Where is that money? It's somewhere out there. It's in banks. It's in savings accounts, right? So then when is that money going to be used? What's going to be the actual impact of that? Because once these people begin to increase consumption, the aggregate demand is going to increase. And if the aggregate demand is going to increase, what's gonna happen? Inflation is going to take place. And inflation is going to take place, that's going to affect negatively individuals in fixed income. 33% of Americans depend on government transfer payments, most welfare checks, disability checks, 33%. So if inflation takes place, because we give a, a stimulus package, that means that the government now is going to be forced to increase these benefits of these individuals by a call a ride or increase their, their salaries, and we increase the salaries, then individuals are going to spend more and are going to create even what? Further, further inflation. Okay. And let's see, I think that's about the end of the chapter, guys. Let's see if there's any, any more slides. Nope.
that's it. So as you can see, we have finished the the we have finished the uh, the chapter. We have finished the chapter. 